Hey everybody, welcome back to HPC Tech Shorts, the engineering water cooler here in AWS. Today we're joined by Austin Cherry and my colleague in Singapore, and we're going to talk about uh, Parallel Cluster 3's config, uh, and more to the point, how it uh, how it maps back to, to very much like an infrastructure as code kind of concept. Hey Austin. Hey nice to be here. Um, Parallel Cluster 3, we've evolved it again from 2. That config file, the way that we actually specify the infrastructure in there, it's changed quite a bit. Um, yep. Uh, and, and there's some really good things about it because it kind of, you read the config now and it looks like the infrastructure specification. Yeah, so I think maybe let's start with giving a flavor of, uh, you know, cloud formation and how we kind of ease uh, the burden of actually knowing and creating cloud formation scripts. So maybe you can just bring up that uh, graphic, uh, Brendan. Here we go. Great, awesome. Yep. Cloud formation by itself is a really powerful tool, by the way, right? Um, it's infrastructure as code for AWS. Um, the idea over here now, as you can see on the left-hand side, is that uh, if you want to translate a physical cluster design into uh, the right-hand side, which is what you have uh, on AWS, um, you need cloud formation uh, that can you know, kind of spin up all of these resources. But you have parallel cluster in between uh, to help you out, right? So uh, essentially what we're talking about over here is um, you know, moving your design into a parallel cluster configuration file, which we're going to talk about in a second. And then parallel cluster itself does the heavy lifting of you know, translating that to cloud formation. And then finally, cloud formation is the one that actually creates your um, entire HPC environment on the cloud, complete with the compute nodes, the head node, uh, visualization, and luster. Learn, yeah. schedulers, you know, MPIs, Absolutely. everything, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cluster in a box. So let's look at a let's look at a cluster in the wild. Uh, essentially, if you look at the um, you know the configuration file, uh, which I can just open, so pcluster.config.ini, this is what um, the definition or the cluster definition uh, actually looks like right now with Parallel Cluster Three. Um, as you can see, we have highly simplified it uh, from Parallel Cluster Two. Um, it's actually got a hierarchical structure now where you have a head node, this head node allocated uh, or a, sp a space where you can actually define the head node properly. Um, and then you can uh, basically go into defining the compute, the networking, and the storage, right? Uh, and the networking itself is implicit uh, over here as we're going to give you an yeah, idea. And the, and, the compute, and the compute fleets are really defined and driven by the scheduler, which is why they're inside that scheduler section, yeah? Uh, I might just want to highlight that just for you know your view. Yeah. Uh, and the idea over here is you specify the scheduler, and we have a choice of two schedulers now, either Slurm or AWS Batch. And within that scheduler, we actually define uh, resources. Now, at a high level, you have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a head node section, a scheduling section, which has uh, the computing uh, compute resources, and you have a storage section at the bottom over here, which defines the high performance storage, for example. Uh, and as I mentioned, the networking is actually implicit. Uh, and we'll come to that uh, in a bit, basically. So uh, in the scheduler uh, section, as I mentioned, you can select the scheduler. Uh, and looking at the resources, we have over here a definition of compute queues so you can have multiple compute queues over here right you've um, set up multiple different different queues here in your slurm cluster you've yep. set up a you set up a queue for a single node jobs another one yep. for multi node jobs another one for gpu jobs Correct. and we'll get into some of the options you've tinkered with there because you've it's this is really good you've exercised a few of the options in here to show everybody what what's possible but sure. but one of the one of the aspects of doing that, like thinking about this from an infrastructure as code point of view, if you're building an on-prem cluster, you just go and build with some gigantic cluster full of one commodity single node, right? Exactly. And you exactly. kind of have to, and if you're going to have two machine models in there, like, you know, uh, a bunch of machines with normal, you know, with four gigs per core, and then a bunch of machines with like 16 gigs per core, because you've got some yep. heavy memory uh, jobs. Absolutely. You have to sort of guess in advance what the ratio of those things are going to be, and you oh, have yeah. to sort of be willing to live with the consequences of that decision for years. Oh, so yeah. thinking about clusters from a much more elastic point of view, 
you do, you know, you do have a think, well, you know, single node jobs don't need high performance computing network attached exactly. to them. Like they can do yeah. with just standard Ethernet. So we'll go yeah. for cheap nodes that have just got Ethernet on them and don't have anything fancy. Um, exactly. And, and you're saving yourself some costs and also increasing the, 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 the availability of the capacity, you know, out of the cloud for that. I mean, it's, it, these are these are sort of decisions that you want to, these are things you want to think about when you're designing your HPC cluster in the cloud because you've got the freedom to do it. It makes a lot of sense. Now, Absolutely. but you've actually chosen multiple different types of instance in here. Like you've got some C5s and C5As. Can you yeah. talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, as you rightly pointed out, it is uh, an elastic environment. So we go much beyond what a typical cluster on-prem kind of offers today. Um, as you mentioned, there are compromises, uh, you know, you need to make, uh, especially that you've seen this on-prem where you stick with a more monolithic design, maybe a single uh, type of a single architecture design or maybe two architectures at the max, right? Hmm. Um, but on AWS, we have this ability to actually have multiple different architectures. So in this case, as you can see, I have a C5-24X large, which is an Intel instance, and a C5-A-24X large, which is uh, similar core count, but an AMD instance, right? And mm -hmm. obviously, uh, there are trade-offs between the two architectures, uh, as the AMD instance has more memory bandwidth, for example, um, uh, and so on and so forth. The idea over here is to have the instance that you want to pick when you want to run a certain type of job. So in this particular cluster, I can uh, you know, run a plethora of different types of jobs from you know high uh, compute, basically um, you know high in core count or basically a high frequency or basically a high memory bandwidth. Uh, you know, it can take the shape that it really wants, right. uh, and the cluster can actually provide for it, basically. Right. And, and you could, you know, like you just said there a minute ago, if you had a job that, that, like if you had a particular workload that was amenable to a high frequency CPU or it was maybe a really expensive ISV license and you really wanted those CPU cores to be as fast as possible for your single threaded jobs, you just exactly. go and get a, a you know, a, one of the Z instances, right, an M5ZN or something like that and just let it go exactly. completely bonkers yeah no that makes a lot of sense all right so uh let's uh, now let's talk about storage because that's sure. you know that's the final piece right yeah absolutely so beyond compute you know for having a you know high performance you know cluster uh you need uh high throughput storage as well many attacks right uh and over here just by adding a couple of lines in the configuration file you're able to spin up um Probably one of uh, the most complex, uh, you know, uh, storage um, configurations that we know of for HPC, which is Luster, a Luster con uh, configuration. Uh, so we have about 1.2 terabyte of Luster allocated to this cluster. Um, one of the good things that we have with respect to Luster, though, uh, FSX Luster, that is, on AWS, is the fact that it actually mirrors uh, onto an S3 bucket. So you can actually save uh, quite a bit of, um, you know, cost in terms of putting all of your data in S3, which is the most cost-effective storage that you would have uh, on AWS, and then just use uh, the Luster as a scratch file system, um, you know, or a persistent file system on your cluster, and just able and just be able to move data into the Luster file system when you require it. And so, as you can see over here, there's an import path uh, which is pointing to an S3 bucket, uh, which is where I'm going to, you know, put all of my data. Um, as well as some of the applications, the binaries and things like that, and and just use the Luster file system uh, for you know what is really really you know used for, which is basically throughput, doing but you know storage doing exactly. stuff extremely fast, right? I mean, exactly. This is using a Luster almost like a, a fast caching tier in a way on top of S3. Exactly. You, you know, S3 becomes your source of truth for your long-term data. You leave it in S3, you know, over the long term. In fact, you may even want to age it out into Glacier or something. Exactly. But but you, you keep your data long-term in S3 and you just pull it into FSX, into Luster, whenever you yep. need it, whenever you need to do high-performance I.O. on it. That's, yep. you know, it, uh, it, we're, I'm going to get you to show us actually how you create a cluster in a minute, you know, the, sure. the command that you type, because it is, uh, for anybody out there like you and I, who's had a career in hardware building Luster right. file systems at some point, right, yep. it is tantamount to magic when you see oh, that yeah. command get typed and you think, okay, that command just created a cluster 
and a exactly. lustre file system and I don't have to sit in a machine room for six weeks. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. It uh, blows my mind even today as well. Thank okay. You. Is there anything else we want to see in this uh, in this config file? Uh, do we want to talk about sure. the EFA oddity yeah. that we picked up the other week? Exactly. So um, let's look at some of the networking. I talked about the networking be, uh, being a bit implicit. So as you can see, uh, you know, there's um, you know a few things about networking that are essential that you need to have. Like for example, uh, the subnet that you're going to define for your cluster. So you have uh, the VPC uh, on top, but you also have a subnet that you will define, and we can provide the subnet over here. But beyond that, uh, when you talk about HPC, we are talk and talking about scaling workloads. You do require a high performance, um, you know, uh, internet. Uh, sorry, network, uh, networking, basically, uh, yeah. or uh, internet network. Yeah. So if you were a user of Parallel Cluster Two, just be aware of this minor quirk. What what the config here is forcing you to do. You'll get an error, by the way, if you if you get it wrong. But what the config is forcing you to do is to take a position, uh, have an opinion as to whether you want a placement group or not when you're using EFA. It, we decided yep. it should not be an implicit uh, assumption that we would make. We'd, we'd force the force the user to make a decision as to whether they wanted it or not. Now, uh, exactly. uh, in almost all cases, it would be logical for an EFA user uh, to want to use a placement group, and that because that that all it really means is that the instances that you get allocated in this compute queue are going to be close to each other. Uh, and and in EFA yep. terms, that's obviously a, a good thing. Fewer switch hops, you know, reduces the overall, you know, complexity for moving packets around on the network. So, exactly. so, so it makes sense, but it's a it's a minor quirk, and and everybody should be aware of it. I I think yep. the last thing I just want to add here, um, if you're looking at this config file and going, oh my god, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, stress not, uh, because you can actually just type a you can type p cluster configure. Uh, exactly. on the command line and you'll get prompted to go through the wizard much like you did with parallel cluster 2 uh, it'll prompt you through for some very sensible defaults so uh, i think it's hyphen hyphen config and then um uh and output so and what this does is that as you can see it's now going to take you through a menu driven option um and you can pick the you know the uh the region you can pick the compute instances for the head node for the compute node uh, and so on and so forth. And what that does in the end is that it actually creates that configuration file that we just saw in this file that uh, file name that uh, or file path that we specified, right? So in part two, we're going to come back uh, next week, and Austin's going to spin up one of these clusters, and we're going to look at the internals of the cluster to see what it looks like and see how it maps back to the back to the uh, uh, configuration file that we just created. So if anybody morning. out there's got ideas that they'd like to see us cover in future tech shorts, please DM us on Twitter. Our DMs are open. Uh, we'd love to hear from, from you. Uh, Austin, thanks for coming today and talking to us. My pleasure again. Thanks for having me, Brendan. <laughs> Thank you.